we lift our eyes to a hope beyond Our creation waits with an expectation To declare the reign of the Lord our God Break the silence. Now the silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens call the earth respond. A creation shouts with the voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be for the risen one is overcome And for every fear There's an empty grave For the risen one is Sing that again. He shall reign. He shall reign forever. Strongholds now surrender for the Lord. Our God has overcome. We can be against this Jesus. Our defender, he is Lord. And he has overcome. We will not be moved. Sing it out. seat. I want to welcome you today, Greater Hope Church, to our 9 a.m. service. My name is Stan, and I'm the pastor here. Uh, again, if you did not get a bulletin, if you're just coming in, I highly recommend it back there on the angel tree table uh, because it has the lyrics to all the songs as well as uh, scripture readings and things like that uh, that you're going to need throughout the service today. Uh, we had a wonderful Christmas party on Friday night right out here. You can see the tent still there. Uh, if anybody wants to get married this morning, just let me know because we're set up for it. Uh, wasn't it nice Friday night? Oh, yeah. Uh, we're really glad that y'all came out. And yeah, very good turnout and a wonderful time. I, I was telling Stacy um, that was the best church party I've ever been to. That was my personal opinion. I, I enjoyed so much being with you guys and appreciate y'all. Uh, I don't say it enough how, how grateful I am to be a part of this church family. Uh, also, something else I was thinking about, I uh, probably don't say this enough either, how much I appreciate and we all appreciate the music team and the AV teams, right? Um, and, I, and I just, you know, we could say that every single week, but I wanted to say that this morning. We're really grateful to God for all of y'all who work on, in music and AV. Uh, it's been a long and winding year for them as well as for us, and they've hung in there. 
and uh, continued to help lead us in worship week after week, whether we were online or in person. Really grateful. Uh, speaking of online, thanks for joining us this morning if you're watching in. Uh, we have, I think, fixed all of our tech issues related to online, so it should look good and sound good once again, and so thank you for being a part of that. Uh, on the back of the bulletin, there are some announcements, not as many this week. We've kind of you know, burned through most of our, our Christmas events so far, believe it or not. We're just a couple of weeks away. But uh, one thing I want to remind you of is the weekly coffee on the grounds right out here uh, between the two services. So about 10.15, we'll be wrapping up in here, and you can go out there and mingle with the 11 o'clock folks and enjoy some donuts and coffee. Uh, also, today is the last day to turn in your angel tree gifts. Um, I'm very, very grateful for this, that every single one of the 35 kids that we had on the tree were taken. And uh, you guys are providing a couple of gifts for each of those kids. Those kids are at Purcell Elementary, Kingsford Elementary, and Mulberry Middle School. So very excited. Their parents this week are going to begin to pick up those gifts. So praise the Lord for that and a great way for us to show the love of Jesus during this time. Uh, also, December 23rd, that's Christmas Eve Eve. We're going to have our first uh, Christmas special service right here in the building. Uh, you can come either at 5 p.m. or 6.30 p.m. on that day. It's a Wednesday evening. Uh, the format of the service is very simple. We're going to read the Christmas story. That's the lessons part. And we're going to sing a bunch of Christmas hymns or Christmas carols. That's the carols part. It's going to be a very simple service, but it'll be about an hour long. Uh, kids w will enjoy it, I believe. That's our goal. We're going to try to help them enjoy it more. So even though we're not going to have child care we encourage you to bring your children. That'll be great. Um, speaking of child care, we are getting ready to ramp up again. We, you know, since COVID started, we haven't had our full slate of kids' classes, but we're, we're trying to work towards that. And so in order to do that, we've had a lot of change, a lot of shifting. If you're interested still in helping and you're already approved, please let my wife Stacy know that you're still in for it. Uh, if you want to help with our kids' classes but aren't yet an approved volunteer, also see Stacy, and uh, we will try to help walk you through that process. Uh, we do need more people. We, we have a nursery at 11 a.m. up to uh, three years old, and, uh, but here at 9 o'clock, all we have is a self-serve nursery right down here. We want to have nursery both services, and we also want to have other kids' classes available at least one of the services uh, coming up as soon as we can. Make sense? Uh, last thing, I said I didn't have a lot of announcements, I'm sorry. The last thing is today was supposed to be a baby shower for uh, Kayla and Ben with little baby Berkeley, but because um, of COVID and everything, out of abundance of caution, we're not gonna do an in-person shower, but you can bring those gifts through next Sunday to church. And uh, again, my wife Stacy will collect them and we'll deliver them over there. Uh, Berkeley's doing well, Kayla's doing well. Keep praying for them, beautiful little baby girl. If you're watching in right now, hello to the Derricks. <laughs> hello to the Derricks. All right, y'all ready to worship? Yeah. Uh, if you'll look at your uh, order of service today, I want to start us out with a call to worship. It's a simple sentence from the Bible here. It says this, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Oh, Lord God, we thank you that even as in uh, days of old in the Old Testament, you had your people build a house for you, a temple. And when they gathered there, you heard their prayers and you met with them. So now through Jesus Christ, you have built your people as a temple. This morning, we thank you for this space that you've enabled us to come into and, and to use, but Lord, really the temple of the Lord is not a physical brick and mortar building, but the temple of the Lord are your people in whom is faith in Jesus, who is the ultimate temple, the one that we can come into the very presence of God through. Thank you for the cross, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the resurrection and for the gift of the Holy Spirit this morning. We adore you, Lord, that you are worthy even of our silence before you. That's what it says here. Let us keep silence before God. Lord, this week we've been talking a whole lot 
fill in the air with our words, some good, some bad, some indifferent. This week, we've been silent before many other sources of information, many other sources of hope and strength. But today, Lord, I pray that we would resolve in our hearts and that you would help us by your spirit to keep silence before you and before you alone. Calm our hearts so that we can hear from you. And Lord, as we come, we want to quietly today and humbly confess our sins to you. Lord God, you alone know the many sins that we've committed. You, you alone know the sinful nature of each of our hearts, our shortcomings, and all the ways we fail to love our neighbors. We wander from your ways, God. We waste your gifts. We forget your love. Lord, I pray that you would have mercy on each of us. For we are ashamed and sorry for all we've done to displease you. Please forgive our sins. And help us to live in your light, we pray. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hear the good news this morning. This is the gospel of forgiveness and hope from Romans 3. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Would you stand to your feet this morning as we begin to praise the Lord? Uh, first of all, standing, we're going to affirm our faith together. This affirmation of faith comes from Psalm 117 and the book of 1 Timothy. You'll see there there's a part for me and a part for you. Let's join our voices together. Praise the Lord, all the nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for, for great, great is his love toward us, us and, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Beyond all question, the mystery which true godliness springs from is great. He, he appeared in the, the flesh, flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up to glory. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's join our voices together. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Let us hear this morning's Old Testament scripture reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. This is the word of the Lord. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planning for the Lord. For the display of his splendor. Mm -hmm. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Mm -hmm. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest 
and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness, and praise spring up before all nations. Mm -hmm. This is the word of God. Yeah, as we sing these next two songs, the goal is to orient our, our voice to praise our God. We are not Jewish, right? We're not from Israel. And so praise God that he did come to save the whole nations. That is a narrative through the whole scripture. It's not just in Jesus, but it starts in Genesis 1 and goes the whole way through. And so what better reason do we have than to lift our voices and praise our God who has saved everyone? So let's sing together. Let us find our rest. 
the bow and bends the spear and tells the war to cease. Almighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with Sing that again, the oceans. The oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives away, the mountains move into the sea. Lord of the Lord of the angel armies, mighty and awesome are you. And we thank you, God, that you have clothed us with garments of joy, clothed us with your great salvation. And so, Lord, as we turn again to your word, I pray that you would cause your word to shine out like a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Without you, Lord, we are in darkness, but we thank you that you are the light of the world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. 
Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. And if you have your Bible or the scripture sheet in your worship bulletin, you can see today's sermon will come from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're continuing our uh, series here on the first two chapters of Matthew, looking at his version of the Christmas story. And once again, he's giving us a part of the story that nobody else in the Bible does. This is the only place in the Bible that the Magi, or commonly known as the three wise men, are found. So let's read together Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time when the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, come and report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is God's word. Well, this in many ways is a very familiar story, isn't it? If you know, you know a little bit about the, the background of Christmas. And yet, once again, Matthew is showing us Christmas is anything but uh, cute and quaint, right? Christmas is not just cute and quaint. Uh, we've said it, I think, every week so far. Christmas is what? War. Christmas is war. Uh, it's like an invasion uh, into enemy-occupied territory by the God who made the world because he's coming to claim it once again to, for himself, to gather his people in. And the story of the three wise men, or, or the magi, they're better called magi. We're going to see why in a, in a few moments. Uh, the story of the magi is a story about how the birth of Jesus shakes the very nations all around Israel. Here you have foreigners, people who live far away from Israel, far away from God's purposes and the covenant story that God had been telling. Yet, even through the stars in the sky, they were drawn by God to come and see his son, the baby, to be born, king over the Jews. In other words, this is a story about how God shakes up the whole world. And if we understand the story of Jesus, I'm going to tell you all again, he can shake up your life. And that's a good thing. It's an absolutely good thing. But when he shakes you, listen to this, when he shakes you, it's going to reveal what's inside you. You hear that? When he shakes you, it's going to reveal what's already inside you, and sometimes that's not very fun to see. Amen? Um, one, a great uh, counselor, he, he writes books about sort of Christian counseling, said this, uh, human beings are like water bottles. When you open up the top and you shake a water bottle, or when you squeeze a water bottle really tight, what comes out? Water, Water, right? (laughs) And he says, look, humans are like that. The shaking and the squeezing doesn't actually put the water in the bottle. It just shows that it was already in there hidden before, right? Undisturbed, quiet, tranquil. But when things come in life and shake us, when things come and squeeze us and put pressure on us, we don't know anything about that in 2020, do we? When those things happen, what really comes out is not just some fluke, not some glitch in the system. What comes out is what's actually already embedded in my heart. And so here in this story, Herod, the king, he loved to call himself the king of the Jews. 
He's shaken, and what, what's revealed is pride, right? The, the leaders of Israel, of, of Jerusalem, are shaken, and what's revealed? Their desire for comfort and ease. And yet, these magi, foreigners, way away from God by nature, when they're shaken, what comes out? Worship. And so take a look at your uh, bulletin today, and we're going to see different ways that Jesus shakes us up as he shakes the whole world. First of all, we see Jesus crossing boundaries. Secondly, we see him shattering expectations. And lastly, we see him trading treasures. Let's look at it together. First of all, Jesus is here crossing boundaries, and that's the idea of the Magi. The reason why I said they're, they're really not, it's not really good to call them the three wise men. And that for a couple of reasons. Number one, we don't know if there were three or not. You know, there could have been a bunch. There could have been maybe just two. And we know there were multiple, but it doesn't mean there were three. That's always assumed because of the three gifts they offer. And maybe that's a right assumption, but maybe not. The other reason is the word magi actually doesn't mean wise men. That is a way of churching up the story that Bible translators have done throughout time. And if you have an ESV, you'll see they continue that tradition from the King James of calling them wise men. Uh, the NIV, which I read out of, said straight up magi. And that's just right out of, the Greek, uh, out of the Greek of the New Testament. Magi is the plural form of the word magus. And a magus is where we get the word in English magic. Magic. In other words, these were magicians. They were sorcerers. They were wizards. <laughs> and they came all the way from Hogwarts, way out there in Persia, right? Because they read the stars. That They used astrology, which is not, you know, not always, you know, the thing that in church you talk about using, right? And you shouldn't use it. But they used it. And even though they shouldn't have used it, God still drew them in. In other words, we see Jesus here crossing all the boundaries that people had made for entrance into his kingdom. And we see Jesus even crossing some of the boundaries that God himself had set up. Because now he wants to announce the gospel is going to go out to all the world, not just to Israel. Not just among the Jews, not just among the people who naturally seem like they're the God type. But he is going out to the people who seem like they are the opposite of the God type. Magicians from Persia who love to spend their time reading the stars coming in to Israel to ask, where is this king of the Jews? Because I want, we want to worship him. Isn't that amazing how Jesus does that? I remember as a kid watching the, uh, a movie called King Ralph. Have you ever seen that movie? Really old, you probably haven't seen it. I probably didn't get very good ratings. <laughs> but it was John Goodman starring as Ralph Jones. And he was a lounge singer in Las Vegas, Ralph Jones. You know, so not, you know, not the classiest fella. No offense to lounge singers in Las Vegas, but this particular one was not the classiest guy. And over in England, there was a, uh, a gathering of all the royal family, and they were taking a picture, and it was raining, and... Something happened where the, the electricity feeding the camera, I don't know if this is really even possible, but this is what happened in the movie. The electricity feeding the camera got hit with the water and all the royal family in one moment just died, were electrocuted. And so, it's, it's a funny movie, yeah. It's supposed to be funny, <laughs> right? They all just, boom, fell over dead. And the next thing that, that the royal people had to do is they had to figure out, well, who's going to be the king? And so they traced down the lineage and guess who it was? Ralph Jones, the lounge singer in Las Vegas. He was a, you know, cousin once removed, twice removed, or whatever, of somebody who married into the royal family, and he didn't even know it. And suddenly he's whisked over to England and he becomes the king. Really hilarious movie. And I'll never forget, the whole thing is about the tension between those who were prim and proper British royal people trying to deal with this John Goodman, this lounge singer from Las Vegas who liked to impersonate Elvis on the weekends right? Very big contrast. And, and as I, you know, read this story, I thought that must be, there must have been a lot of comedy in this story and, and probably also a lot of anger and rage even, serious rage, because the people of the Jews were trained, rightly, some rightly, some wrongly, to see people like these magi as total and complete outsiders. 
just, they were, I mean, it was like somebody walked up into church who you would think would never be there. And not only did they walk up into church, they walked up to the pulpit and they began to preach. And you thought that that person, you know, doesn't even belong here. And yet God says, wait a minute, whose church is it in, in, anyway, right? Whose grace is it anyway? There's a similarity here really to the, the story of Jonah in the Old Testament where Jonah thought, surely God, you know, isn't going to show grace to the Ninevites. And the whole point of that story is, wait a minute, whose grace is it? It's not your grace, Jonah. You don't get to decide who gets it. I get to decide who gets it. And so here we are. Not only does God call shepherds, we, we talk about that all the time, but here God is calling wizards from Persia to be among the first people to praise the newborn king. Uh, God wants us to see that Jesus reigns over all things. Do you believe that this morning? Jesus reigns over the whole world, the, the one who hung the stars. The one who causes the stars to shine was certainly able to, to make those stars line up in such a way that it became obvious even to pagans that a great king was going to be born in Israel. God did that. The stars praise the name of Christ. And so the star readers followed the book that God had written in the skies. In the same way, God writes his, his message, the message of the gospel in the Bible. And now the Bible has been spread all throughout the world in all the different languages of the world. And because of Jesus' death and resurrection, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the nations are being undeceived today. Isn't that right? For the past 2,000 years, the nations have been undeceived little bit by little bit as more and more people have come in. See, Ben is right. Not many of us in this room have a Jewish background. There actually are some of you who do. <laughs> yep, I, I, one that I know of in here right now who does have a Jewish background, but most of us don't. And yet, look where we're sitting, in the presence of Christ. Look all over the world, the places where the church is growing more than anywhere else. There are places where people for years and years thought it could never work there. And yet God crosses boundaries. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn in two. You get the picture, right? What used to block people away from God now is removed. And so I think there's a couple things we can learn from this, this, this first point. The first thing is this, y'all, we got to lay down our pride because pride in the church is, is like King Ralph in the royal family. <laughs> that's, the real, that's the real disjunction here. It's not between certain people and their maker and their God. The real disjunction is between proud people pretending to be Christians. Amen? It just can't be because where does racial superiority fit, fit in with a Christ who crosses boundaries? Well, where does class or, or you know, economic superiority fit in with a Christ who crosses boundaries? Uh, where does religious pedigree my grandma and great-grandma and great-great-grandma were Christians, and I take pride in that. And that's a wonderful thing, actually, to have that heritage. But that doesn't make you better than the person who was heathen, right? <laughs> Generations back. There is no place for pride. The church cannot be a place with high walls. Why? Because Jesus came and preached peace to those who were near and peace to those who were far away. And he has torn down every wall. He's torn down every wall. It's also the second thing we learn here is that we got to lay aside our unbelief. Not only our pride, but our unbelief. Sometimes it's not pride that causes us to think we can't be saved or other people around us can't be saved. Sometimes it's just we don't believe God is really that interested in saving people like us or people like them. Or maybe God's not able to forgive my sins. They're just too big. Maybe you're somebody watching in or here and you think that. I've done bad things. I've separated myself from God with things that I can't even mention in church. Well, guess what? Sorcerers from Persia had done that too. Well, we're in good company as sinners, right? We're in great company. In fact, every single human being is a sinner. And in order for God to draw you in, he has to cross a boundary. This morning, do you believe that Jesus had to cross a boundary to get to you? Or did you naively think that you were already a native in his land? <laughs> Natives in his land don't exist. Only foreigners. He brings us in by grace.
That's the first thing. Jesus crosses boundaries. But second, look at, he also shatters expectations. Shatters expectations. Uh, where did the Magi go when they were going to find the king of the Jews? Where did they go? Think about it. First of all, Jerusalem. They went to Jerusalem. And who did they visit in Jerusalem? The king. King Herod. Remember, Herod was self-styled. He called himself the king of the Jews. He took a lot of pride in that. Even though he himself was only barely Jewish. He was like 1 16th Jewish. And yet he called himself the king of the Jews. And so the Magi, they don't know a whole lot about Israel. It becomes pretty clear through the story that they're very, pretty ignorant about things. All they've done is just simply read the stars. And so they show up to Jerusalem, the great world city of the Jews. They waltz into the palace of the great King Herod, and it's there that they expect they're going to find the king to be born. And doesn't that make a whole lot of sense? Kings are born in kings' families. Kings are born in palaces. Kings are born in great metropolises, big cities, you know, that have all kinds of stuff going for them. But when they get there, King Herod is just as surprised as they are. In fact, Herod probably assumes that if there's going to be a king born, where is he going to be born? My house. He's going to be my kid. What are you talking about? A king of the Jews has been born. I haven't had a baby. And in fact, at this point, Herod's pretty old. It probably passed the ability to have children. And so he's kind of scratching his head. More than scratching his head, he's, he's tearing his clothes. He's anxious, filled with anxiety because he wonders, who is the usurper? Who's the one trying to steal the throne here? Because if there's a king going to be born in Israel, it's going to be born in my house, from my line. But notice, Jesus shatters expectations in a way that you can't even read in the stars. If you just read the, the world, you know, and, and by the way, you can know a lot about God just from looking around the world around you, can't you? I mean, it just comes to you. The only reason why we don't see it is because our, our minds are darkened with this prejudice against God. But we're prejudiced. But if we weren't prejudiced, we'd look around and see God is great. God exists. God created. God's the judge. God's the ruler. But here's one thing you can't see just from creation. God shatters expectations by ruling in humility. In order to know that, you've got to have the Bible. In order to know that, you've got to have the story of Jesus and, and all the promises of the Old Testament that led up to Jesus. And so when Herod couldn't figure out where the king was to be born... It says there in verse 4, he called together the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. He knew, I don't know it by nature, and so i got to look to the Bible. There's a whole lot of things like that. And here's what they said. Uh, he's going to be born not in Jerusalem, not in the palace, but in Bethlehem. Bethlehem? Uh, Bethlehem was a tiny little village outside of Jerusalem, five, six miles outside. And yes, it had been the place where David the king was born, but none of the other kings since David had been born there because it was just a podunk place. It was the, a town of shepherds. Um, even today, I, I've been to Bethlehem, and it's, some of y'all have been to Bethlehem, and it, it's literally there's still shepherds abiding in the fields all around Bethlehem. That's about all it is. When you compare Bethlehem to Jerusalem, you're talking about Mulberry to New York City. Just in terms of the, the, the metropolitan style of the one and the backwoods, you know, backwardness of the other. Right? And there's just a very, very massive difference. Now, I, for one, prefer Mulberry over New York <laughs> and prefer Bethlehem over Jerusalem. But not a lot of people who were thinking in Herod's way did. And so it took the Bible and took prophecy for them to understand that it's in Bethlehem, verse 6, in the land of Judah, which is by no means the least of the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Out of you is going to come, become a king who is going to be a shepherd of his people. That's important. In the ancient world, they used to compare kings to shepherds. And the Bible does that, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And yet, here, here's the mystery of history. Very few kings have ever acted like shepherds. Think about it. 
I mean, why is it that we as Americans kicked out the king in 1776? Why did we do that? Taxes? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, taxes in short. Well, because people felt like the king had abandoned his post as the one who was supposed to lead, feed, defend, and care for his people like a shepherd of sheep. He was far off. He, he was unconcerned. He, he abused and used more than he served. You see, a shepherd serves sheep. And what an amazing thing. It shatters all expectations to think that when God comes to earth to reign, he comes like that, as a shepherd to serve rather than as a tyrant to just beat people down and grind them into dust and use them. He comes to serve his people. Jesus said it this way, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Could you get any, any more different than Herod? Well, why did Herod want to be king of the Jews? To be served. I mean, we, we know a lot about Herod, and that's one thing he loved. He loved being waited on. He loved the luxury of being king. One thing you know about Jesus, he didn't care about those things. He's a man who didn't even have a place to lay his head most of his life. He was despised and rejected of men. Right? Uh, Jesus didn't come in royal robes regally. He came as a carpenter with sawdust under his fingernails with dirt between his toes because he wore the sandals of the common people and walked on the common streets. That was Jesus. He hung out with sinners and tax collectors, and so people understood that this was a, a God who shattered expectations. He surrounded himself with the people that, he, that normally wouldn't be, and, and there he laid aside his, his robes and he served them, even at the end of his life, washing their feet which only the lowest of the servants, the lowest of the slaves at the time would do that job because it was a filthy job. Think about it. Of course, ultimately, the, the great humility of God is found at the cross, right? Amazing that the king wouldn't be holding a scepter in his hand. Instead, he would have a nail through his hand. The, the scepters would be driven through his hands. He wouldn't have the uh, the, the throne, uh, footstool at his feet. Instead, he would have nails driven through his feet. Not a crown like Herod's of jewels and gold, a crown of thorns piercing his scalp, the blood flowing down. Now, Jesus came as a very unique king. He's the only one like him. And yet, that's the gift that God chooses to give me and you. What does that say about God, that he gives that gift? What does it say about me and you that we need that gift? I mean, think about it. When, uh, when you receive a very you know, good gift from your spouse at Christmas, it says something about them giving it, and it says something about you receiving it, right? And so sometimes you're super excited because clearly that gift is so valuable that that person clearly loves you. It reveals their love. And it's something you wanted, and so your heart's just filled with joy. There's something in you that's just uh, completely uh, fulfilled by receiving that gift. But sometimes, have you ever received a gift from your spouse that offended you? Maybe they gave you something chintzy. I mean, let's be honest. We can be honest in church. They, 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 they you know, they cheaped out on you, maybe. Or, or, or maybe... They gave you something that revealed something unflattering about yourself. Ever get, been given a treadmill? <laughs> Ever been given a Fitbit? Uh, maybe a subscription to Rogaine? Uh, somebody ever give you a whole pack of breath mints? Like a whole you know, year's supply of breath mints? I mean, those kinds of gifts, right, reveal something about the giver, but they also reveal something about the recipient. Right? Isn't that right? If God gives a humble king to us who came not to be served but to serve, who came not to live for himself but to die for us, what does that reveal about us? It reveals that in our pride, the only thing, the only thing our pride needs is to be put to shame by his great humility. That's why Christmas is war. He came to put you to shame. And he came to put me to shame. 
Not, not bad shame, not bad you know, shame that lingers over, over nothing in your life and the shame that can overtake you. Jesus came to set you free from that shame. But there's a way in which when you look at Jesus, if you're looking at him rightly, you will be ashamed. I will be ashamed. And we will come and bow down before him because here is a king who serves, who washes our feet, who washes our, us head to toe of all of our sin, who gives us new life. Are you willing to be humbled like that? Are you? Am I? That's what Christmas calls us to. To see the baby born in a cattle stall in the garage of the hotel rather than in the, in the room. Laid in a feeding trough. Shaming our pride. That's the second thing. Lastly this morning and very importantly, this is where we're going to maybe walk away with some things to do. We see Jesus trading treasures. And this is the part of the story that is, you know, very famous. You know, the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. Look look there in verse 7. Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Why is Herod so concerned? Well, when Herod is shaken up, what comes out? Say it with me. Pride, right? When Herod is shaken, what comes out? Pride. He wants to know where Jesus is and exactly when he was born and exactly how old he is. He wants the wise men, verse 8, to go find him and come back. Not, as he said, he's, he's just blowing a bunch of smoke. He really does not want to worship Jesus. Instead, he wants to rid himself of a pretender to the throne in his view, right? That's why Herod's concerned. You see, his treasure is himself. He's been his whole life long seeking himself. And when pressure comes into his life, it, you know, the, pop, you know, the top pops and out comes all that pride and all that self-righteousness and self-concern. But notice the Magi, these sorcerers from Persia. Verse 9, after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were what? Overjoyed. Not filled with pride. Not filled with self-concern and self-defense. Overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they did what? They bowed down, and they worshipped him. That's a strange baby shower. Right? I mean, we, you know, we, we, we dote over babies at baby showers, right? We dote over babies when they're first born, but I've never seen anyone bow down and worship one. It's strange. And yet, for, I don't even know how the Magi understand this. We're not told how they understand it, but somehow they've put two and two together. This baby is worthy of worship, worthy of adoration. And then it says, they opened their treasures up. And they presented to Jesus gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They opened up their treasures and they gave to Jesus. Again, this is a weird baby shower. I've never heard a parent ask for gold. Although, it's not a bad idea, right? I've definitely never heard them ask for incense. Hey, give, give us some incense now that our baby's born. And never, ever, ever have I, have I seen on a Target registry myrrh. Right? Never, ever. So why, why those gifts? Those gifts were highly symbolic. Highly symbolic. Each of them symbolized something different. And this is usually the reason why we think of three magi, because maybe each one has their own gift to offer. Maybe there were more. We don't know. But these three gifts symbolize so much. The gold symbolized kings. Uh, when one king would conquer another, the, the lower king would just give a bunch of gold to buy him off. They called it tribute. And it made peace between the two kings, and it showed that I am putting my kingdom underneath your kingdom. That's what these men from Persia were doing. You are the real king, this baby with Mary, his mother, and I'm putting my life under your reign, my kingdom underneath your kingdom. What was frankincense? Well, frankincense was an incense. It was a special incense used usually in temples. Incense symbolized, and even today, in some churches and places, they use incense, right? Smokes up the whole room, and 
The reason for that is in the Bible and Revelation, incense represents the prayers of God's people in his presence. Here they're recognizing, I am in the presence not just of a king to give tribute to, but of God. Emmanuel is right here, God with us. And, and I want to, at least in this moment, glorify and enjoy this God who made me. And so they give incense. And lastly, myrrh. You know what myrrh was used for? As far, far as we can tell, it was mainly used for just one thing. It was used by undertakers to prepare a body for burial. That's a strange gift for a baby. And, and I actually have no idea why the Magi gave it. Maybe what well, was in their mind anyway. But I think without a doubt, as Matthew's writing this, he understands what God intended through the gift. Because even though Jesus was Lord at his birth, he was also destined for the cross at his birth. And just as Mary, not Mary his mother, but the other Mary, just as she anointed Jesus' feet with myrrh later in his life, and Jesus says, you are preparing my body for burial, even at his birth, the three magi are preparing this baby for his future burial. Their understanding that if this king is going to save people like us, a death has to be offered up. And we're here to make, pay homage to that death. Here's how, here's how Christmas, here's how Jesus shakes up our lives. He enables us to trade our old treasures for new ones. King Herod was unwilling to do that, and many people today are unwilling to do that. Maybe some of you are unwilling to trade your treasures for the treasure of Jesus. You want to hang on to the keys of your life. The wise men opened up their treasures. I don't know how much those things cost, but it was way more than your typ typical baby shower gift. And they gave it up willingly because they recognized what's in that baby is more important than what's in this bag. What's in that baby is more important than what's in my treasure bag. And so here you go, Jesus. This is the way our hearts always work, right? A greater treasure flushes out a lesser treasure in the heart. Some of y'all kids may be asking for a, the new Xbox or the new PlayStation for Christmas. I don't know if you are or not, but think about what you're doing when you ask for that. Several years ago when you got the last Xbox, you thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Now you want to throw it away. It was your treasure, and now you're looking for another treasure. Why? It's new and improved, right? It's better. That They've designed it to be even better than it was before. And so when you see that new shiny thing, you're, you're ready to chunk the, you know, chuck the other one and, and to put that new thing back in its place. When Jesus comes to us in the gospel, that's what he's asking us to do. Chuck it all, right? Throw all of the other things that we are holding in our hands away so that our hands can be filled up with him. In our sin, we have traded God for ourselves. That's what sin is, trading God for self. In Christ, God traded himself for us. That's what the gospel means. And now, if we receive Christ, we'll be willing to trade everything to receive what he is coming to fill our hands and hearts with. That's the, the gospel in a nutshell. We trade ourselves for God. God trades himself for us so that now we can trade again and receive that which is truly treasure. And so this morning, what are you doing with your gold? Is he the king that you're giving your whole life to? Do you truly depend on him? I mean, that's the way to honor Jesus. That is the way to honor Jesus. Depend on him alone and not on yourself. Do you glorify God and do you enjoy God? I mean, enjoy him. Do you enjoy God? That's what the incense is all about. Does the aroma of incense, not literal incense, but figurative, does it fill your life? Where you're just delighting and spending time with the Lord? That's how you honor Jesus. And myrrh. Have you knelt lately at the foot of the cross and remembered that your king had to give his life for you? Have you ever felt the burden of your sin and shame that you're carrying? Have you ever felt it snap off and roll into the tomb? The only way you can do that is to kneel at the cross, to render him myrrh, faith in his death. Would you pray with me this morning?
Lord, we thank you so much that you sent those years ago, those three magicians to come all the way to Jerusalem and to Bethlehem. God, it's a, it's a cliche to say that, you know, wise men today still seek him, but it really is true. It really is true. Lord, when we truly see who Jesus is, the only thing that could keep us from falling down and worshiping is our prejudice. And so, God, please clear away our prejudice today and give us new life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this next part of the service is the offering. And this is not just about money and finances. I've been trying to emphasize this. This is mainly about us responding to God's word. And just like the wise men offered to him something, every one of us this morning could offer to God something. It doesn't have to be money. Uh, it certainly doesn't. It can be your heart. It can be your thoughts. It can be one particular thing in your life that you're having trouble yielding to him in faith. Let's do that. We're going to first sing the doxology together and then take a few moments to quietly offer our hearts. Let's sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Let's take a few moments and offer our hearts to God. join me in prayer again. Oh Lord, we offer up our hearts to you today as promptly and sincerely as we can, Lord. We pray that you would take away our insincerity. Lord, forgive our insincerity, Lord, and help us to truly and fully from the heart yield ourselves to you, our gold, our frankincense, our myrrh this morning. Lord, we come to you today knowing that you're the God who hears prayer. And God, we want to pray today for our nation, God, that uh, we've received the, the good news about vaccines on the way. And we, we just pray that you would superintend, that you would rule over all that situation. Please help uh, this pandemic to come to an end, Lord. We pray that you continue to give us patience as it, as it drags on. Help people to have love and, and care and concern for one another. Help us as the church to lead the way in, in those things. God, we pray for our world today. I want to thank specifically of the nation of Nicaragua. I was um, talking to some folks today about, or this week, about that country and some of our friends there that are, that are in the work of your church. Lord, we ask that you would help them to continue to recover from the two hurricanes that came through late uh, in this hurricane season. Lord, folks who didn't have a lot to begin with have even less. And so, God, I pray that you would sustain them in faith and in hope. Lord, help us to know how to serve them well. Father, I pray for your church here and all around the world, but, but here at Greater Hope, would you prepare us for the return of Christ? If your first coming was, was disrupting and if it shook us up, I mean, imagine what your second coming will do. It'll shake not only the heavens, but the earth and the sea and the dry land. All nations you will shake. God, help us to be ready, each and every one of us. 
We pray for those in our church in need. We want to pray especially for Tina and, and the DeBoer family. Continue to heal her body and provide for her as she goes into the next stages of her treatment. Thank you that they're here today. We pray for Sharon as she's over at Tampa General recovering from surgery. Help her over the next several days to rest and to recover. Mm -hmm. We want to pray for Mo's dad who had a heart attack this past week. Thank you that he's still alive and we, we ask that you would continue to sustain his life and draw him to yourself. For the Derricks, Lord, thank you for little baby Berkeley. We give you praise for the gift of new life, and we ask that you would bless that, that new, newly formed family with your spirit and presence. God, be with those in Mulberry who are hungry this Christmas season, who are jobless. Be with those who are lonely, and help us to be friend to the friendless, food to the hungry. Help us, Lord God, to be guidance to those who have, who have lacked guidance in their lives. We pray it in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's sing together this great song. If you'll stand, uh, what's the song called? Angels from, from the, the realms, realms of, of glory. glory. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is one of the rare Christmas carols that we hardly ever sing, so that's it's right. good. <laughs> Yeah. 
Come and worship. Thanks for being here today. If your faith is in Christ, know that he is God with us. He's our king. He's our priest. He's the one who died on the cross to give us life. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in his peace. Enjoy coffee on the grounds with us, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks for rolling with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>